This is the Panavia Tornado. During the Gulf War, this versatile multi-role aircraft flew with Britain's Royal Air Force, the Royal Saudi Air Force, and the Italian Air Force. Tornadoes were assigned some of the most dangerous missions of the war, attacking heavily defended airfields in Iraq and occupied Kuwait. <laughs> Tornado missions required pilots to fly daring, low-level, high-speed attacks hundreds of miles behind enemy lines. The assignment was dangerous, and some tornado pilots never returned. In 1972, the British Aircraft Corporation joined forces with West Germany's Messerschmitt Bolkel Blum and Air Italia to form the Panavia Consortium. Together, the top aerospace technicians of the three countries created a two-seat variable geometry airframe adaptable to nearly every combat mission. Panavia fitted their new jet with a full complement of computerized systems. A powerful radar was installed in a high-level interceptor version of the tornado. A navigation and attack computer allows the plane to fly as a deep interdiction fighter bomber. The tornado's twin engines and swing wings give it power and flexibility. The basic airframe was deliberately designed to be adapted to different roles, much like the U.S. Navy's multi-purpose A-6. The Tornado F-3 variant is an air superiority interceptor, while the Tornado GR-1 is an all-weather bomber. The GR-1 can fly at 600 miles per hour, 200 feet above the ground. But standard tornadoes aren't equipped with laser target designators, essential equipment for dropping precision bombs. A new version of the tornado fitted with a laser designator was rushed into service during the Gulf War. It flew alongside an equally new variant, the Tornado GR-1A. The GR-1A is an all-weather reconnaissance plane that was used extensively to hunt for Scud missile sites. This is uh, an electronic countermeasures EW jamming pod designed to confuse enemy hostile radars. And then further to the right, this is not a, uh, a bomb, this is in fact a 2,250 litre fuel tank which will extend our range and we carry two of these. Moving on to the fuselage of the aircraft, of the Tornado GR1A, the difference between a GR1 and a GR1A is that there are no guns mounted on this aeroplane, instead we have internally mounted infrared reconnaissance equipment and immediately visual is one of the sideways looking infrared sensor windows here and there is one on the right hand side as well and within this fairing underneath the fuselage is a window which would open which is an infrared line scanner which will give us complete 180 degrees horizon to horizon coverage Britain's Royal Air Force is the principal operator of the airplane. But at one time or another, virtually all Tornado pilots have flown together during NATO training missions. Generally, these missions involve Tornado F-3s flying combat air patrol, while Tornado GR-1s practice low-level high-speed strikes. But when the Gulf War erupted, GR-1 pilots had to adapt quickly to a dangerous new environment. One thing that helped ease the learning curve was the close-knit relationship of Tornado crews. Like the teams who fly F-111s, Tornado pilots and bombardier navigators develop bonds that help them surmount daunting obstacles. When Kuwait was overrun by Iraq, Tornado pilots and the rest of the British Expeditionary Force found themselves facing the greatest challenge of their careers. They were deployed to the Gulf on August 9, 1990, less than a week after the invasion. Eventually, 25,000 British soldiers were sent to the war zone. Britain's Royal Air Force contributed 135 aircraft, including 18 Tornado F-3 fighters, 12 Buccaneer bombers, 
12 Jaguar fighter bombers and 46 Tornado GR-1 attack and reconnaissance planes. During the Gulf War, the dozen RAF Jaguars flew 617 sorties, flying combat air patrol and bombing missions. To camouflage their aircraft in the new battleground, the RAF changed the color of their planes from European green to desert pink. This also helped differentiate British tornadoes from the Saudi and Italian models that flew during the Gulf War. Ultimately, 31 nations deployed armed forces in the Gulf. In the build-up before the war, some predicted that the coalition would never hold together. But the quick establishment of a central leadership kept anarchy at bay. General H. Norman Schwarzkopf became commander of all forces. General Charles Horner led the coalition air campaign. Sorry, been struck by a 117. This is a team effort. The second aircraft comes through. The idea of having uh, one air boss in charge of air operations in the war uh, was new insofar as implemented in this war, but it's been around for some time. In fact, it's been fundamental to the concepts for employment of air in Southwest Asia. Uh, we've trained this way for years. I arrived in the Gulf two days before the war started. Had I not had training with Americans using the procedures that we actually adopted during the Gulf War, it would have been very difficult at such short notice to have achieved the mission uh, and to have achieved it so, so well. Well, it shouldn't surprise anyone to find that the, uh, the British and the US uh, fighter squadrons are very uh, similar uh, in uh, their approach toward uh, war fighting is very similar. But that's true of uh, the majority of the members of the coalition. We trained together and we had practiced together, so to speak. And so when it came time to fight the war together, it was the same thing that we had spent a lot of years getting ready to do, and we were able to do that. And so whether it was the British or whether it was the Saudis, uh, or whether it was the UAE or whether it was the French, there was a cohesiveness there that uh, permitted us to do uh, what we thought we could do without any deference to who was doing it. And that's the important thing. British forces were scattered across Saudi Arabia. They operated out of an airport parking lot in Dehran and bases in Riyadh, Tobuk, and Bahrain. The British found themselves living in desert tent cities and finished barracks. It all depended on the luck of the draw. Wherever they were, they worked alongside the other members of the multinational force. This included some 425,000 Americans and 137,000 troops from Saudi Arabia, Oman, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain, as well as 7,000 troops who escaped from Kuwait after the Iraqi invasion. Pakistan, Czechoslovakia, Canada, Bangladesh, Syria, Argentina, Senegal, and Sierra Leone also sent in men, planes, and ships. Italy sent in 10 of its tornadoes to fly air superiority missions. Altogether, more than 695,000 soldiers from around the globe were sent against the Iraqi army, which numbered close to a million. The Royal Saudi Air Force flew both tornado interceptors and bombers. Mirage F-1s were flown by both friends and foes. F-1s from Qatar joined F-1s from the Free Kuwait Air Force, which flew with the Saudis. I read stories about how uh, the Saudis uh, were not going to perform well. They performed superbly. Uh, I remember one tornado mission, the guy had to cut a runway. He put every one of his bombs right down the center line of the runway. Uh, certainly the example where the two uh, mirages were coming towards the oil fields, and the Saudi flight lead rolled out right behind them, AWACS gave them a vector. Uh, so the idea that uh, one kind of air force is not as good as another air force is really not true. Uh, you have great individuals in every air force, and you have guys that have a little trouble getting up to speed. That's true of all air forces. The key on how well an air force performs is how well your intelligence is and how well your command and control works. In this case, uh, I think we had superb support from both.
Britain's Tornado GR1s flew low-level bombing missions deep in Iraqi territory. And they took the heaviest losses of all coalition aircraft. The tornado force represented just 4% of Allied air strength, but it suffered 26% of the casualties. The problem was that the Iraqis had an awful lot of uh, AAA guns uh, to defend their airfields. And at night, to see this solid wall of tracer go up was something that no one had ever really experienced before. And it's very frightening and very distracting. Uh, and uh, although it probably wasn't that effective, it uh, certainly tends to take your eye off the ball. Oh, come on, what fucking heading have I got here? Zero, oh, zero, 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 stop, don't stop. Lincoln, Lincoln and Stanford Buckeye, <laughs> suck it's behind you. And the tornado suffered a lot of high, uh, a higher rate of losses than some of the other, other aeroplanes, partially due to the nature of some of the sorties we were flying. And also, we had a, a fair degree of bad luck as well. Um, if you haven't got luck with you, then obviously you're not going to survive. Well done, Benny. Yes, Toss them all in. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. Yeah. Make a big bang. Yes, to say the least. 20 to 25 of us killed every year in normal training accidents. And to be honest, uh, the loss rate was no more than we would normally experience in peacetime, especially considering the amount of flying and the type of flying that was being done. Very low level, very demanding training indeed uh, during the build up to the war. So losing friends is um, something that's not new. It's something that we are used to. I mean, it never comes very easy. Uh, but it's something that's not that unusual. Five tornado pilots were killed in action. Another seven were captured by the Iraqis and held as prisoners of war. Fortunately, the war was short. By March 1991, all Allied POWs were released to friendly forces. Another problem facing the RAF and all coalition pilots was the unusually poor weather in the Middle East. As any pilot will attest, things can get tricky when you're flying at night. The weather was not um, beautiful desert, clear blue sky weather. There were a number of thunderstorms and with great turbulence. Now, because this airplane is only a very small airplane, and it only carries a, a limited amount of fuel, all our operations involved air-to-air -air refueling with uh, one of our tanker aircraft. On some nights we were actually tanking in very, very nasty thunderstorm and electronic storm weathers where the aeroplanes were being buffeted around uh, quite significantly and all the pilots to a man did extremely well and uh, to be able to make contact with the tanker aircraft and take the fuel. But the major safety threat was still Iraq's surface-to-air missiles and anti-aircraft guns. So after losing five planes in the first week, tornadoes were sent to higher, safer altitudes. The RAF claimed this was done not because of the high loss rate, but because air superiority had been so quickly achieved that tornadoes no longer needed to bomb airstrips. But the fact remains that although the tornado is a versatile airframe, it was not designed for medium-level bombing, nor had its crews ever trained for that mission. Three, two, one. Should see an impact soon. Gone. Impact is... Moving Dropping laser-guided bombs from medium altitudes was new to GR-1 pilots, who specialized in delivering their unguided JP-233 runway denial munitions from treetop level. But laser-guided bombs were also capable of blowing holes in Iraqi airstrips. However, JP-233s create a much wider circle of destruction they carry 30 concrete cratering bomblets and 215 delayed fuse mines, making airstrip repair a hazardous enterprise. Switching to laser-guided bombs cut down tornado losses, but RAF pilots still praise the destructive power of the JP-233. The tornado was always going to be used for low-level uh, attacks against the airfields using the JP-233. Uh, that is such a specialized weapon, only the tornado can drop it. It was always going to be used for that. Um, and there's no way you can drop that weapon from uh, medium level. So it, the path was clear. We had to do that. Bloody marvelous, you little tooch. 
Five tornadoes were lost during low-level attacks on Iraqi air bases. But although the bombers were sent to higher levels, the six reconnaissance tornadoes continued to fly high-speed, low-level missions for the duration of the war without a single loss. I will say this, the uh, Brits uh, were very courageous. They took a lot of casualties, and uh, my hat's off to them. They never, never missed a beat. One bomb gone, two, three, four, five, six bombs gone. Good hit. Splash. I'm still tracking it, 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 still tracking it. Happy, bomb is gone. Happy. You get this, Norman, I buy you verbal and coke tonight. The first Tornado GR-1 fighter bombers sent to the Gulf weren't equipped with built-in laser designators. So the RAF sent over a dozen Buccaneer bombers armed with PaveSpike laser designators to mark targets for tornadoes. GR-1s carrying Paveway laser-guided bombs flew in three ships of two tornadoes and one Buccaneer. Buccaneer navigators called the shots. I'll be stopping the turn, mate. Okay, fine. Sink it right and then left. Drink it right and left. Yeah, whatever you can to hold it. We're nearly over. I was sent to the Gulf uh, three weeks into the war, actually, because I was um, involved in a new project which was just coming into service at the time, which was a new laser designation pod uh, called Tiled. And it was still under development at the time. So before we could take it out there, we had to actually develop it and get it fit to work and prove it works before we deployed. Call me the laser fire. Okay, laser fire now. Tile stands for thermal imaging and laser designation. It was an experimental system rushed into service for the Gulf War. Five tornadoes were modified to accept the tiled pod. Tiled was successful, though as with every new weapon system, problems did arise. Laser's not firing. Laser's not firing. Laser not firing, you piglet. Fire. Because when you're fighting from the air, you don't actually see much of the enemy. In fact, you don't see them at all. Even when you can see the targets you're bombing, you don't actually see people, especially when you're bombing from medium level. So you don't actually get the impression that you're fighting anybody at all. In training, we practice against targets, uh, you know, just uh, airfields or, or buildings out, uh, out and around. And to a large extent, flying the war missions was exactly the same. It, it didn't feel any different, except for the fact that there was um, lead coming flying up at me every now and again. Want to get out of here? Yeah, if you're right. I didn't actually feel anything directly uh, for or against the, the Iraqis. They were just the targets, the job we had to do. It's not like a soldier who gets more deeply involved and actually has the fight going on all around him. Yeah, I can see. It's pretty bloody close, if not dead on. All the targets which were uh, used during the precision bomb phase were all military uh, targets, whether they be hardened air shelters or uh, ammunition bunkers. They were all designed to prevent the Iraqi war machine from operating eff effectively. Got the bridge. There's not such a thing as a clean war. You can't just take out the, the targets without killing people or killing innocent people, if you like. Um, but you can go a long way towards it by using guided weapons. But they're expensive, very expensive. So you have to trade one against the other. When ceasefire was called on March 3rd, the RAF had flown over 6,100 sorties, the largest number flown by any nation except the United States. The five tiled tornadoes flew 72 successful sorties in 17 days. The six GR-1A recon tornadoes flew 128 night sorties and the 46 British GR-1s in the Gulf flew over 1,600 sorties. There are a lot of people who say that air power won the Gulf War. Uh, I have a little trouble with that because air power is only one part of the land, sea, and air campaign. Uh, I am very proud of the contribution that we made working together, flying side by side. 
And it wasn't only the United States Air Force, it was the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Islamic allies, our European allies, the French, the British, the Canadians. We really pulled together as a team. And I believe one of the reasons the war got over so quickly and with so few casualties is because of the lethality and flexibility of modern air power. U.S. naval buildup during the Gulf War was the largest such mobilization since World War II. Six carrier battle groups massed in the Middle East, and the decks of those carriers roared nonstop. The sleek F-14 Tomcats were perhaps the best-known planes on board, and Marine Aviate Harriers were the other stars of the deck. But the Navy's key asset was actually the oldest, least glamorous plane on board, the venerable A-6. This late 50s design filled three crucial roles in the Gulf, tanking, electronic jamming, and long-range attack. Streaking in from the sea, A6s were bold reminders of the deadly potential of power projection. A6s have rolled off Grumman Aerospace Corporation assembly lines since the late 1950s. Over the years, the plane has gone from vacuum tubes to microcircuits. It was designed to fly in all weather conditions, both as a marine close air support plane and a Navy long range medium bomber. Flying complicated bombing missions requires a two man crew. As with F 111s, which fly similar missions, two aviators sit side by side, pilot on the left bombardier navigator on the right. The first A6A intruder was delivered to the Navy in 1963. Soon, A6s were being mass-produced and flying directly into frontline combat in Vietnam. During the Vietnam War, the Navy's new attack plane underwent years of brutal field testing. Today, the A6 looks much the same as it did 30 years ago, but inside, it's a different airplane. Computer bombing systems and terrain-following radar have been added to give the A6 true ground-hugging, day and night, all-weather capability. The A6E's Target Recognition Attack Multi-Sensor, or TRAM pod, lets the airplane drop laser-guided bombs with great precision. An important variant of the A6 went into service in 1970. The EA-6B Prowler jams enemy radar and communications. It can also fire radar-seeking harm missiles at hostile positions. The KA-60 tanker plane is another A-6 spin-off. KA-6s refuel Navy planes and transfer gas from huge KC-10 tankers and deliver it to carriers below. The A-6 has been uh, fundamental to the Navy and its interdiction efforts, and again, proved very valuable in this war. Uh, we used the A-6, like the 111 and the F-15Es, early in the war to attack targets, such as airfields, communication sites. And then later, we used them with precision munitions and also CBUs against troops in the field in Kuwait. So you're never in this war alone. You're always working together, uh, one unit with another, and it really doesn't matter what country or what service you come from, you mix and match the forces so you have the most capable systems working together. During the Gulf War, more than 150 coalition ships patrolled the waters near Iraq. More than 100 of these ships were part of the United States Navy. 
The six aircraft carriers in the Gulf region represented half the Navy's active carrier strength. Generally, each ship has about 85 planes on station. The aircraft carrier is there, forward deployed, uh, kind of an offensive punch, and it provides us with some very unique opportunities. Uh, the A-6 has got a unique mission, and one, that there, there's two aviators in it. We can deliver those smart weapons. We can carry an enormous amount of ordnance, and even though that there's Air Force aircraft that can carry more than we can, because we're forward deployed, and we can go to places that they can't, it gives us an opportunity to go out there and strike if we need to, and gives us that opportunity that it just can't be equaled with any other aircraft. The Gulf War gave the Navy yet another opportunity to prove the worth of power projection. When Operation Desert Shield became Desert Storm, Navy and Marine pilots flew alongside the U.S. Air Force and the rest of the coalition air wing in strikes across Iraq and Kuwait. Few intruder crews had previous combat experience. In fact, most A-6 pilots were younger than their planes. Keep it up. Stand by for attack. Roger. Good attack symbology. Blazers on. I'm in auto. Nine miles. One minute to release. The, the hard part about combat is that you don't know how you're going to react. When you see that situation, it's not a game anymore. And that can be very scary. When you get to that case where it's not a simulator, but it's actually a real missile, or it's not, um, you know, a simulation, it's actually AAA, you've got real bombs on you, and people are trying to shoot at you to kill you, that's when you really wake up and say, hey, if I have not studied, if I have not prepared, you know, am I really going to be ready? Am I? You don't know until you get to that situation. And I think if you ask them deep down truthfully, hey, did you have doubts? I'm sure every single guy had doubts. If they said they didn't have doubts, they're lying to you. Stand by. Here they go. Good steering, man. Give me good steering. Easy. Here they go. I'm in designate. Get limit to designate. There it is. Easing the turn. Flashing no no impact point. You guys are steady. Everything's steady. It's gone. It's gone. Keep going. Pull it around left. Aircraft carriers are floating cities where space is at a premium and all operations serve the needs of the flight deck. Deck activity is always frenzied, but never more so than during wartime when pilots, sailors and aircrew work exhausting shifts with little regard for the rise and fall of the sun. Carrier life is extremely regimented and for good reason. Standing in the wrong place at the wrong time can be fatal. The noise on deck is deafening Crewmen communicate with hand signals, intercoms, and headsets. Shirt colors quickly let you know who does what. Blue shirts keep planes from rolling off the flight deck. Red shirts handle bombs, rockets, and ammunition. Below the deck, they ready the weapons that pilots take into battle. An accident here can cripple a ship, so every action is checked and double-checked. In wartime, though, the pace can be exhausting. White and silver are the colors of safety men. Yellow shirts direct taxi traffic. Green shirts hook planes up to catapults. And everyone answers to the air boss, the chief controller of flight operations. No plane leaves the deck without the boss's approval. The air boss is a veteran flyer, and his word is law. In the handler's room, men move toy airplanes on a replica of the flight deck. This is the handler's table, nicknamed the Ouija board. The Ouija board tells the traffic, fuel, ordnance, and safety men the status of every plane on the ship. When toy planes are moved on the board, real planes are moved on the deck. Once in the air, pilots are handed over to the Carrier Air Traffic Control Center, a dark chamber in the bowels of the ship. Non-stop electronic communication keeps crews in touch with their mother ships. Combat missions can be taxing, but Navy pilots seem to unanimously agree that landing a plane on a carrier deck in bad weather is far more frightening. I had one where we were manning up on the carrier. It was about 11.30 at night, very, very dark, raining cats and dogs, and... Uh, uh, there was a thunderstorm that, for some reason, was centered right on top of the ship. And uh, somebody said, 
on the radio, oh, it's not that bad, it's gonna pass here in a second. And I'm looking around at, at these cats and dogs coming down in the flight deck thinking, what are we doing, you know? Um, and I was scared, I mean, I was scared. And down to two miles and just pouring down rain, can't see the ship, can't see the ship, at a mile, there it is, land. And, uh, ooh, <laughs> I tell you what, that's, uh, it's an eye opener, it's an eye opener. Typically, you'd come back from a, uh, an overland mission, and your heart had been racing, you've got the adrenaline pumping, you get over the gulf, and now it's an opportunity for you to relax. Well, especially if you're coming back there at night, well, you get about 50, 60 miles away from the ship, and that adrenaline starts pumping again. It's always difficult to get on board at night. Flying at high subsonic speeds 200 feet above the desert floor might also look difficult, but it's not, thanks to terrain-following navigation systems. But during the Gulf War, intruder pilots flew at much higher levels than they were accustomed to, often above 10,000 feet. This helped them survive flak and surface-to-air missile attacks. I'm sure every guy that's in this hangar can tell you there were times where he saw a missile coming up, and you don't know for sure if it's guiding on you or not. And you're going to be able to pick up that missile visually, and you don't have a choice to take the chance of whether or not it's guiding. You're going to have to maneuver to defeat it. And the same thing with the AAA. Another bomb's going off. Uh, AAA, there. AAA, there. Uh, that's your... Man, that's had a lot of AAA down there okay. now. A good buddy of mine in, uh, in VA-65 was hit with AAA one day when I was flying. Uh, we went and rendezvoused on his airplane uh, and, and basically did a, uh, you know, an airborne checkout to see how much damage there was. There ended up being a hole in his wing about the size of a, uh, a large chair that you could slide through. And uh, we followed that airplane home uh, and watched him land at a divert field. He, uh, unfortunately, could not see the hole because it was near the outside portion of the wing and was blocked by um, some wing structure. He was talking about trying to lower his flaps and slats. He said, no, 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 don't, don't do that. Uh, so again, the danger was out there. No matter how easy people thought it was, you could uh, run into danger. That's up in the second package. It's about 10 minutes out. Five's away. Got this method on the rug here, looking good. Oh, yeah, right through him, man. The number of airplanes shot down by the Iraqis was low, but it did happen. I fly the A6E intruder attack aircraft. It was extremely difficult. Uh, Jeff was uh, assigned to VA-35 at the time, and that was my previous squadron. Uh, I had flown some with Jeff. I knew everyone in the squadron. And uh, just prior to our first uh, mission into Iraq is when we had gotten word that some of those airplanes, A6s off of the Saratoga, had actually been shot down. It was a difficult time. Uh, I could say that. The night before that first mission, I, I laid awake in bed for quite a while, just thinking about thinking about exactly what was going on with Jeff, what were his thoughts, and what specifically was happening to him. In future wars, pilot losses will be reduced by using weapons such as the Tomahawk land attack missile. 297 TLAMs were fired from battleships and submarines at the most heavily defended targets in Iraq. At least two were shot down, but the rest flew some 600 miles at heights as low as 100 feet before hitting targets smaller than a garage door. TLAMs are the metallic face of modern warfare. Given the mission of the A6, the crew coordination is very important. And that's what gives us the advantage over other airplanes, is that the interaction that we have between the two crew members. Now, specifically during the war, uh, the pilot, as we'd be approaching the target, would basically uh, be flying an unpredictable flight path. So he'd be bending the airplane back and forth while the, uh, the BN, the bombardier navigator, would have his head inside the hood uh, trying to pick out the specific radar blip. As the pilot's doing that, that lazy maneuvering back and forth to evade the radar uh, systems that are on the ground, he's looking for the missiles, he's looking for the AAA, and then the, the BN is sweetening up the targeting solution. And then there's, there has to be good crew coordination, talking back and forth the status of the system, where the threats are, what you're actually seeing out there. When the BN hands off from the radar to the flare, that he does have a good track, he's got good laser indications that the pilot's got good indications on his screen, that he's releasing the weapons, 
And then as they're coming back off target again, that both crew members have their eyes outside the cockpit, they can talk back and forth, pick up the threats, maneuver the airplane to keep them out of harm's way. You see anything on the players? I can see something hard. I right, just go for it. There we go, rolling in. Right, well, you fly with one other guy primarily, you get to the point where you can communicate using mic clicks and glances and, and not have to verbalize. Um, it becomes very, very close, um, very, very coordinated. And that's what makes this airplane special. And that's what makes it work so well. I think that the, the whole experience was much easier than we um, thought it was going to be. However, we unfortunately lost an airplane and lost a crew. As a matter of fact, the, the pilot was my roommate. So one day you've got a roommate, and the next day you don't. So yeah, the, the war was easy, but uh, it was not without cost. Intruders usually flew in groups of four and dropped both laser-guided bombs and unguided gravity bombs. Laser-guided bombs were the weapons of choice but poor weather over Iraq often made it impossible for laser designators to lock onto targets. On poor weather days, A6Es dropped cluster bombs and other unguided munitions. Okay, come in the 237 on the heading, Roger. Quick leg just to make sure we got them off. Roger, right on the uh, honeycomb that we were talking about going for. They're still dropping. Roger that. See how we do here. Oh, yeah. A little bit short, not bad. Nice picture. Yeah, nice picture, though. I'm going to leave it on there for a... Uh-oh. Oh, we got... Oh, I fire right around 15 grand. Roger. Intruders were also sent out to stop Iraqi naval vessels carrying anti-ship missiles and sea mines. Those things are difficult because they're moving targets. It's not like a land target that you say, hey, I know where it is today, I know where it's going to be tomorrow. And because they're constantly moving, um, they're difficult to find and they're difficult to attack. Towards the latter stages of the war, with the depth of the water, you'd get situations, you have a sunk boat out there somewhere in the Gulf, and you'd get a radar blip, and you'd go up there to investigate, expecting it to be a target, and here it's something that's already sunk and it's still sticking up above the water. But not all A6s were carrier-based. Marine Corps pilots flew intruders and prowlers from land bases in Saudi Arabia. During the peak of Operation Desert Storm, 93,000 Marines, almost half the active duty force, were in the Gulf area. Marine intruders flew close air support and interdiction missions to protect the soldiers on the ground. The Marines brought 20 A6E intruders and 15 EA-6B prowlers to the Persian Gulf. Like their Navy counterparts, Marine A6 crews brought a variety of weapons to bear against hostile forces. But Marine pilots have closer ties to ground troops than other aviators. Their number one priority is to do whatever they can to aid and protect Marines on the ground. But whether flying from land or sea, A6s proved that an old design is not necessarily an outdated design. I think the reputation that we have, the capability that we have with this airplane is just superb. Uh, everybody here in this hangar, though, would tell you that they'd like a replacement for the A6. It is old. It's been around since the early 1960s. And they've done a good job with improving it, you know, the internal systems, changing the software, giving us additional capability. 
But to have something such as stealth technology, uh, other technology to the internal components would only make us more survivable. However, given the package that we have to work with, it, it's an exceptional platform. We always uh, marvel uh, at what the F-18 guys, for systems in their airplane, and they've got some very neat things, some very state-of-the-art uh, capability that, that we don't have. Um, and again, yeah, we like to have a new airplane. Everybody would like to have a new airplane. But uh, again, given the jet that we have, I think we do very well. And I think if you look at the overall picture, um, our performance in Desert Storm was fantastic. Um, you know, in our squadron alone, uh, nine airplanes, we dropped 1.2 million pounds of ordnance in Desert Storm. And that's, that's a lot of bombs. Release. Bombs away. Go 180 in the heading. I'll track this and see what happens. Down to 19 point. Boom! 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 Good hit. God damn, right across there. Decent hit. Up to 19, Ron. Up to 19. What a great hit. From January 17th to February 27th, Navy and Marine pilots flew some 26,000 combat and support sorties. After the war, the Secretary of Defense, Richard Cheney, said, in a crisis overseas, the first thing somebody asks is, where's the nearest aircraft carrier? Certainly, carrier mobility was a critical factor in August 1990, when the USS Eisenhower and the USS Independence raced to the Gulf after Iraq invaded Kuwait. The swift deployment of Navy carriers, combined with the prompt arrival of Air Force F-15s, might have been the reason Iraq did not continue its push into Saudi Arabia. Sea power also might have helped dissuade Iraq from carrying out its threats to use chemical weapons against soldiers and civilians. The United States let it be known that its carrier battle groups might be equipped with special weapons, the military's polite term for nuclear arms. It is unlikely that the coalition would have permitted the use of nuclear weapons in the Gulf. But if thousands of Arabs, Israelis, and Americans had died in a nerve gas attack, opinions could have changed. In any event, just the threat of nuclear arms seems to have had a chilling effect. Aircraft carriers let the United States quickly respond to crises. In the Gulf War, naval aviation played a crucial part in the coalition victory. Got the hotels on the right, the little harbor. Tower as far as H1, there is two cars of Blackhand Grand Way. Blackhand, I text you, Mike. There is H1 landing, climb at 1 0. Thank you, VK. Roger. Dead eye, final stop. Dead eye, Glutaland 3 4, the wind is calm. Wait for her. Speak to me, Green. Oh, can you land on the taxi? 3 3 Green. Okay, they are calling you on the Yeah, it's got to be them right there. Here's a flare. Good. And a bundle of chaff. Oof, good.
lock up the trailing uh, F1 here. Sure, I appreciate that. Like Norm said. Yeah, it looks like the F1s are climbing now. You see they're at 21,000 feet now. Let me see who this is. Uh huh. There's the trailers right there. Two Victor, Victor, Victor 15 is our Victor 3. It's our Victor what? 3. Alright, copy, let's go Victor 3. So I'm gonna push crawl 5. Okay, check. Falcon, thanks. Falcon with you. 01 from Falcon 05 and Red 4, ready, check. Bang, loud and clear. Loud and clear, we're over. Roger, we'll go Sahab 14, Sahab 14. Spot one one searching, uh, posit. One 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 there, fine. Bank zero one, uh, from fire, Vulcan zero five. Okay, got you loud and clear now, thanks. Uh, too weak and not readable, say again. I did a four nine zero, we'll take off there, sir. Looking. Still nine o'clock high. Axe 2 1, you up? Okay, Charlie, with the other two F4, uh, F1, they are about two miles behind them. Okay, they are 270 uh, and you will uh, catch uh, 3 of them. Thanks, zero 1, come up, Cherry 3. Roger, I just want uh, zero 09 to look at you. Call him Bulldog, okay, say uh, again. Roger 3, Roger 3. Number 4, can tell you are the right man. Affirmative. Roger, I am just uh, joining you from your uh, 3 o'clock now, low. Falcon, picture clean. Oh, a shot. Looks like the last guys in the group are right there. And that's about 10 miles in front of me still. Go ahead, Deeper. Lone uh, Star, Keeper 05, we've just been up in the uh, oh, oh. region of Great International. Sure, the visual. There's various indications up there. <laughs> Ok, 
Ready? Ready. 